Glory to Jesus Christ. Today we'll be reading the commentary from the Blessed Theophylact on the parable of the prodigal son. Uh, and in the cycle of services, in the pre-Lenten cycle of the church, uh, last week we heard the parable of the publican and the Pharisee. This week we hear the parable of the prodigal son. And then next week we hear the last judgment. Uh, so just the sequence of events uh, uh, leading up to the great fast. Uh, so I won't read today the whole commentary from Theophilact because it's quite long. Uh, and so I'll read the commentary on the very first portion of the parable and then in the middle of the parable itself. Uh, and that will leave us maybe more to do next year uh, as we continue uh, reading from uh, Theophilact. So uh, the, the parable of the prodigal son is in Luke's gospel, uh, chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. Uh, and so uh, I'll begin the commentary with the very beginning of the parable itself. Uh, so this is from uh, Theophilact. Uh, this parable presents a man who is, in fact, God, the lover of man. The two sons represent the two kinds of men, righteous and sinners. The younger, sons, younger son said, give me the portion of the property that falls to me. Of old, from the beginning, righteousness belonged to human nature, which is why the older son, born at the beginning, does not become estranged from the father. But sin is an evil thing which was born later. This is why it is the younger son who alienates himself from the father. For the latter-born son grew up together with sin, which had insinuated itself into man at a later time. The sinner is also called the younger son because the sinner is an innovator, a revolutionary and a rebel who defies his father's will. Father, give me the portion of the property that falls to me. The essential property of man is his rational mind, his logos, always accompanied by his free will. For all that is rational is inherently self-governing. The Lord gives us logos for us to use according to our free will as our own essential property. He gives to all alike so that all alike are rational and all alike are self-governing. But some of us use this generous gift rationally in accordance with logos, while others of us squander the divine gift. Moreover, everything which the Lord has given us might be called our property. That is, the sky, the earth, the whole creation, the law, and the prophets. But the later sinful generation, the younger son, saw the sky and made it a god, and saw the earth and worshipped it, and did not want to walk in the way of God's law, and did evil to the prophets. On the other hand, the elder son, the righteous, used all these things for the glory of God, therefore having give all Given all an equal share of logos and self-determination, God permits us to make our way according to our own will and compels no one to serve him who is unwilling. If he had wanted to compel us, he would not have created us with logos and a free will. But the younger son completely spent this inheritance. Why? Because he had gone into a far country. When a man rebels against God and places himself far away from the fear of God, then he squanders all the divine gifts. But when we are near to God, we do not do such deeds that merit our destruction. As it is written, I beheld the Lord ever before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken in the Psalms. But when we are far from God and become rebellious, we both do and suffer the worst things, as it is written, Behold, they that remove themselves from you shall perish. The younger son indeed squandered and scattered his property, for every virtue is, sim is a simple and single entity, while its opposing vice is a many-branched complexity, creating numerous deceptions and errors. For example, the definition of bravery is simple. That is, when, how, and against whom one ought to make use of one's capacity to be stirred to action. But the vice of not being brave takes two forms, cowardice and recklessness. 
do you see how logos can be scattered in every direction and the unity of virtue destroyed? When this essential property has been spent and a man no longer walks in accordance with logos, by which I mean the natural law, nor proceeds according to the written law, nor listens to the prophets, then, then there arises a mighty famine, not a famine of bread, but a famine of hearing the word, the logos, of the Lord. And he begins to be in want, because by not fearing the Lord, he has departed far from him. But there is no want to them that fear the Lord. How is there no want to them that fear him? Because blessed is the man that fears the Lord, in his commandments shall he greatly delight. Therefore glory and riches shall be in his house, and far from being himself in want, he has dispersed, he has given to the poor. Therefore the man who makes a journey far from God, not keeping God's dread face ever before his eyes, indeed is in want, having no divine logos at work in him. And he went, that is, he proceeded, and advanced in wickedness, and joined himself to a citizen of that country. He who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him, but he who is joined to a harlot, that is, to the nature of the demons, becomes one body with her, and he makes himself all flesh, having no room in himself for the spirit, as it was for those men at the time of the flood. The citizens of that country far from God are none other than the demons. The man who joins himself to these citizens having advanced and become powerful in wickedness, feeds the swine. That is, he teaches others evil and filthy deeds. For all those who take pleasure in the muck of shameful deeds and carnal passions are like swine. Pigs are never able to look upward because of the peculiar shape of their eyes. This is why when a farmer grabs hold of a pig, he is not able to make it stop squealing until he turns it upside down on its back. This quiets the pig, as if, by looking upward, the pig can see things it had never seen before, and it is startled into silence. Such are they whose eyes are ever turned to filthy things who never look upward. Therefore a man who exceeds many others in wickedness can be said to feed swine. Such are the keepers of brothels, the captains of brigands, and the chief among publicans. All these may be said to feed swine. This wretched man desires to satisfy his sin, and no one can give him this satisfaction. For he who is habitual in sinful passions receives no satisfaction from them. The pleasure does not endure, but is there one moment and gone the next, and the wretched man is again left empty. Sin is likened to the pods, which the swine eat, because like them, sin is sweet in taste, yet rough and harsh in texture, giving momentary pleasure, but causing ceaseless torments. Therefore, there is no man to provide a satisfaction for him who takes pleasure in these wicked passions. Who can both satisfy him and quiet him? Cannot God? But God is not present, for the man who eats these things has traveled a far distance from God. Can the demons... They cannot, for they strive to accomplish just the opposite, namely that wickedness never end or be satisfied. And then we'll jump in the parable uh, to verses uh, 22, uh, to 22 to 24. And those verses are, But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here, and kill it, and let us eat, and make merry. For this, uh, and began to be merry. And Theophilact writes, The servants, you may understand, to mean the angels, the ministering spirits who are sent to serve those who are counted worthy of salvation. For the angels clothe the man who has turned from wickedness with the first robe, that is, with the original garment which we wore before we sinned, the garment of incorruption, or it means that garment which is honored above all others, the robe of baptism. 
for the baptismal robe is the first to be placed around me, and from it I receive a covering of my former shame and indecency. Therefore you may understand the servants to mean the angels who carry out all those things that are done on our behalf and by means of which we are sanctified. You may also understand the servants to mean the priests, for they clothe the repentant sinner with baptism and the word of teaching, placing around him the first robe, which is Christ himself. For all we that have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And they put a ring on his hand, which ring is the seal of Christ given at chrismation, so that we might execute good deeds in his name. The hand is a symbol of action, and the ring is a symbol of a seal. Therefore he who has been baptized, and in general everyone who has turned from wickedness, ought to have on his hand, that is, on his entire faculty of action, the seal and the mark of Christ, which is placed on him to show that he has been made new in the image of his Creator. You may also understand the ring to satisfy the earnest of the Spirit, by that, I mean that God will give us perfect and complete good things when it is time for them. But for now, he gives us gifts as earnest, that is, as tokens of assurance of those good things to come. For example, to some he gives the power to work miracles, to others the gift of teaching, and to others still other gifts. Having received these gifts, we have more confident hope in the perfect and complete good things to come. And shoes are put on his feet to protect him from scorpions, that is, from the seemingly small and hidden sins described by David, which are in fact deadly. And these shoes also protect him from serpents, that is, from those sins which can be seen by all. And in another sense, shoes are given to him who has been counted worthy of the first robe. God makes such a man ready to preach the gospel and to bring benefit to others. This is Christianity, to benefit one's neighbor. We are not ignorant of what is meant by the grain-fed bullock, which is slain and eaten. It is none other than the very Son of God, who as a man took flesh, which is irrational and animal by nature, although he filled it with his own glory. Thus Christ is symbolized, symbolized by the bullock, the youngling, which has never been put under the yoke of the law of sin, and he is grain-fed in the sense that Christ set up, was set apart and prepared for this mystery from before the foundation of the world. And though it may seem somewhat difficult to take in, nevertheless it shall be said, the bread which we break in the Eucharist appears to our eyes to be made of wheat, and thus may be called of wheat, but in reality it is flesh, and thus may be called the bullock. For Christ himself is both bullock and wheat. Therefore, everyone who is baptized and becomes a son of God, or rather is restored to the status of son, and in general, everyone who is cleansed from sin, communes of this bullock of wheat. Then he becomes the cause of gladness to the Father, and to his servants, namely the angels and the priests, because he who was dead is alive again, and he who was lost is found. For whoever is dead from the abundance of his wickedness is without hope, but whoever is able with his changeable human nature to change from wickedness to virtue is said to be only lost. To be lost is less severe than to be dead. Uh, and we'll stop there. Again, there's, there's much more words uh, from Theophylact about uh, the parable, but uh, this will suffice us for now. Uh, and again, remember that uh, following this parable, uh, on the next week, we hear of the last judgment. Glory to Jesus Christ.